Good morning, and welcome to Investing in Africa, uh, one of the weekly Wednesday webinars. Uh, uh, one of the weekly Wednesday webinars that's sponsored by Fledge and Aviary. All right, before I begin, and as, as people join in, um, uh, who am I? Uh, well, my name is Looney Libis. I am uh, the founder of Fledge and the co-founder of Aviary. I'm a 20-year serial entrepreneur in the tech space. Uh, and then five years ago, switched over and became a, uh, a serial helper of new inv impactful startups through Fledge, the Conscious Company Accelerator. Uh, I teach uh, MBA candidates at Pinchot University, which is the first business school in the world to teach uh, how to do good and do business at the same time. Uh, and this year with a partner, I'm spinning up a seed fund called Aviary. Uh, big shout out and thanks to Investor Circle. Uh, which is a National Impact Investors Angel Group, if you're unaware of them, uh, at InvestorCircle.net. Uh, and a big shout out because they had two trips to Africa in the last year, and I was um, uh, uh, happy enough or uh, uh, lucky enough to join in the second of those trips. Uh, we went to Nairobi, and about half of this talk is going to talk about uh, what, we, what we learned from the Nairobi trip. All right, so let's start out with some... Uh, some basis of, of facts. Um, for those of you who are in the United States, uh, we're all familiar with this map. Uh, I gather most people in the world are familiar with this map. Uh, I grew up on the east side of this map where most of the Americans live. Uh, the states are rather small. You can drive through five or six or seven in a day, um, right? It, it takes you one full day to get from the top to the bottom. Uh, I now live in the top left corner where the states are way larger. Uh, where it takes you all day to cross Washington or, or uh, all day to cross Washington, Oregon, and down into California. Um, they get rather large. Uh, if you're from Europe, uh, you got a similar map. This, the countries are similar sized, the U.S. states, right? There's some big ones and some small ones, and you can spend a day driving across five or six states if you want. Uh, I remember when I lived in Paris, I took a train through uh, France, Belgium, and Germany all in one day and back. Um, so it's a, it's a rather compact place. Uh, and then we all get shown this map of Africa. Uh, and I remember as a school kid, I had to memorize the names of all the, the countries and maybe even the capitals. Um, and it looks about the same, right? It's split up into a bunch of states. On the left, they're kind of small. On the right, they're kind of big. Um, but who knows, right? Without going there and without uh, studying the place in more detail, you think, great, you know, Kenya, Tanzania, those are maybe western states, right, uh, or maybe the middle states. Um, but in fact, uh, when you put them side by side at the same scale, you suddenly discover that Africa is huge, right? You suddenly discover that the United States barely covers the northern part of Africa. In fact, um, I think the scales are still slightly off here because I've seen other maps where the U.S. fits within the Sahara Desert, right, with a little, well, at least the continental U.S with a little bit left over, and, and Europe fits in here as well, and then there's more space for more countries, right? Africa is humongous. Um, and just for comparison, uh, Tanzania is slightly larger than California in, in, in uh, land mass, right? So that's kind of the, you know, the, the, uh, the, one of the big states in the U.S. is one of the average states uh, in Africa. All right, now you can't talk about Africa without talking about a little bit of history. Uh, and of course, uh, most of Africa was colonized. And so if we look at the map in 1945, uh, there's still aspects of that that exist today. Right? So the languages that are still spoken are uh, indicative of, uh, of the colonization. So on the west side, where the French were, they speak French. Uh, and the British, right, which is a, this odd um, greenish color, uh, is most of East Africa. Uh, and then a few on the west side as well, like Nigeria um, and uh, what's listed there as Gold Coast, which, which now uh, is, um, uh, 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 shoot, <laughs> uh, we'll go back to that, um, and, and a few others. And so they speak English on that side. Uh, and then the Portuguese lost their lands, and so the, those are more or less um, uh, equivalent to the British lands these days. Right? And South Africa is its own little beast at the bottom. All right, um, because of that colonization, uh, you will find that in some, uh, well, basically in the British African countries, you will find that there's British common law, 
right? which is not terribly surprising. And so for an American who's doing business in Africa, I, you know, the law looks like the law. It's the same, same basic structure because we were once a colony too, and we took the British common law as our basis. Uh, and in French Africa, they use civil law, which is basically Napoleonic law. Um, and so if you're, uh, if you're from continental Europe, you'll find uh, the law is pretty similar on the west side of Africa. All right, in terms of uh, where uh, investors are dropping into Africa, um, I'm sorry, it was Ghana that, that dropped out of my mind. Um, uh, what I have seen, at least, being Amer American and English speaking, uh, is that British Africa, a former Brit British Africa, is the, the countries where most investors are, are, are dipping their toes in the water for Africa. And so these five, Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda, are by far what I've found to be the leaders in terms of dollars flowing from outside into startups. And specifically, Ghana and Kenya seem to be uh, the go-to countries at the moment. Uh, Nigeria is definitely in there. Um, whenever you see stats about investing in Africa, you will see Nigeria is often at the top. Uh, two reasons why. One, they have 180 million people in that one country. And so it is a, uh, it's the most populous country on the continent. It is a massive country. Uh, and it's also an oil power. So Nigeria and Angola on the West Coast are, uh, are oil countries. Nigeria is a member of OPEC. OPEC. Um, and so a lot of the foreign investment that's going into Nigeria when it's listed on statistical um, sheets and websites and whatnot is oil money. It's going into refineries and so big investments. In terms of little investments, you'll find that much more common in Ghana and Kenya. Then what you, if you're unfamiliar with, uh, with the regions, uh, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, and then um, Rwanda and Burundi make up a federation called the East Africa um, uh, Community. Right? So that's their, their logo up there, the EAC, or they just call themselves East Africa. Um, they added South Sudan recently to that confederation. Uh, and they are going down the path of, or they currently have open borders, just like Europe, where you can just, if you are East African, you can cross the border without showing a passport. Uh, and they're going down the path of creating a monetary union. Uh, and the, the optimists say it's, it's three or four years away. Uh, and they're also going down the path of creating a single country. Uh, and that, the optimists say that's, you know, five to 10 years away. Uh, and if they do that, then they will have 145 million people in the second largest country in, in Africa. And even, even though that hasn't happened yet, the countries are similar enough and tight enough uh, that if you invest in a Kenyan company, it can do business in Uganda. If you invest in a Ugandan company, it can do business in Kenya. You can ignore the borders. All right, in terms of uh, jumping into this field of investing in Africa, uh, there are assumptions that, you know, what I've learned in five years uh, is that uh, there's a lot of assumptions in our heads as Americans and Europeans, uh, and most of those will be st still be true in Africa, but there will be some surprises, and you won't know what they are until they surprise you, otherwise they wouldn't be surprises. Um, first one I learned was about costs. So, uh, again, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've been doing startups in the U.S. for 25 years. And so what I was used to is that all the money that you raise gets spent on people, just about all of them. It helps that I'm a software entrepreneur make that true. Um, well, the startups in Africa are different uh, because the salaries are so much smaller in Africa. Uh, we have companies, I'm invested in companies where they pay $3 a day and that's a really good wage. Um, where they pay management maybe $10 a day, $300 a month, and that is an exceedingly good wage. Right? And so when it comes to raising money and spending it in an African uh, company, um, basically you can think of the employees as being free. Right? If you put $20,000 into a company, you've now paid for the entire team of 10 all year long. Um, on the flip side of that, um, most of the companies that I've invested in need some equipment. Um, and it's not software, so, so I'll, I'll talk about what they are, but they need something, right? And it may just be a truck. Um, what you got to realize is that the trucks and the refrigerators and the, uh, and the plows and the tanks and the piping and every, you know, pretty much everything they need in terms of equipment 
uh, comes from India or China. It all gets imported, right? Occasionally something from Europe, occasionally something from the US, but pretty much everything from India or China uh, because almost nothing gets manufactured on the continent of Africa yet. Um, and what happens is twofold, that you're trying to put money into the companies all right, they're basically asking you for money to raise money, uh, and you're gonna they're gonna take that money and take 90, 95 percent of it and turn around and spend it in yet another country, right, off the continent of Africa. Which, uh, when I realized this uh, last year, 18 months ago, I thought this is a little bit crazy. So if there's you got a region in the world where there's very little money being invested, and yet most of the money that is being invested is actually being funneled back to India or China. So why are we sending them money? Why aren't we sending them equipment was the answer that I had. And, and I worked on a business plan for a while for that. And then I discovered why. But, um, I'll talk about that another time. Uh, once they get the equipment, the next worry is that uh, it will break. Uh, and when it breaks, it can turn off the entire company because they may only have one of these pieces of equipment. Uh, right? There's not a huge number of people in any of these countries that know how to fix things. Right? They don't know how to build them in the first place. They don't, they don't really know how to fix them. Uh, so you have to start worrying about redundancy, all right? Having more than one piece of equipment, buying something that's not the cheapest, buying something that's not necessarily from India or or China because it may break uh, and may uh, may ruin your company. All right. Assumption two is that there's a billion poor people, uh, which is a true statement. There are a billion people in Africa living under two dollars a day. Um, nonetheless, pretty much every adult has a mobile phone. So despite the fact that they're living on $2 a day, they were able to uh, save up enough money to buy a $25 phone, right? maybe even a $40 phone. Uh, it's not a world of smartphones yet. It's still a world of flip phones, but smartphones are, are coming. Right? There, there are people that have them. If you can provide a useful service for a dollar a month right, or a product that's about $10, uh, then the market opportunities are humongous. You, 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 you multiply that by your billion and that is your total market opportunity. Um, if you can do this in Nigeria, right, there's 180 million people that can do that for you, uh, right, they can buy your product. Uh, and so in terms of um, the billion people, you're not gonna get there instantly, you're not gonna get there quickly, uh, but you can do this in countries that have 40, 50, 60, 180 million people in them. Uh, and a dollar a month is $12 a year times 100 million people is a large sum of money. Uh, and the last one is a, a fairly new one, which is uh, what they call PayGo, or what we would call pay-as-you-go. Uh, and PayGo has proven in Kenya and, and, um, and I think all, Kenya and Ghana so far uh, to be able to sell $100 products. And so what PayGo means is, for instance, you, uh, you want to buy a solar panel for your house. Right? So not just a solar lantern, but a solar panel and two lights and the batteries and everything that goes with it for your house. That's a $100 product, right? There's a company called Mcopa that will sell you that, but it's $100, and $100 is outside the range where most people can afford, right? Um, I didn't put it on the slide, but you can think of it about 10% of the population is in the middle class. 90% uh, is not. 90% is below that, right? Where middle class is 3 or $4 a day. Um, and so to sell a $100 product, you got to do something else, right? You have to, you have to do customer financing in some form, and what Encopa has figured out how to do is to put a chip inside their, their box uh, and people pay over the phone 25 cents a day. And, and some of the other system, uh, some of the countries do this with a code instead of a, a phone. Uh, but you pay 25 cents a day. And if you don't pay, then you don't have any lights that day. And people like lights, right? And once you have electricity, you don't want to give it up. And so m many people are able to pay $100 over the course of a year at 25 cents a day. And what's really fascinating is what's come this year, which is other products that are um, being sold by the same company once the $100 solar panel is paid for. Because now you have basically a line of credit and proven customers that are able to pay it, and you have a stick, right? You have the carrot of providing the, the products, but you have the stick, which is you can turn their lights off if they don't pay for that other product as well. Uh, and so that's up and coming, uh, and, and we'll see that roll out across the whole continent. All right, in terms of internet, right, we can reach 5 billion people on the internet. Um, and I said before, every adult has a mobile phone, but they don't have the internet the way that we're used to seeing the internet, right? So they have the internet as in they have text messaging, 
uh, and they could pull up other screens as well, but um, not not even mobile web. They they have um, applications that run on their phones uh, that are kind of indicative of the DOS applications. Uh, there are PCs, there are internet cafes. Uh, you know, people in the cities do have PCs at work, um, but web access is not what it is. Um, not what it was even in the 90s in the States. So when you think of uh, people are connected, they're connected by text messaging. All right, in terms of payments, you also worry about that. So there's you know 50 countries to deal with, with um, many, many different types of currencies. Uh, there are no credit cards. We can jump straight to the bottom. There's not just no credit cards. Uh, very few of these customers even have a bank account. Uh, so in East Africa, where I'm most familiar with, there are saving and credit co-ops that are run by people themselves. There's hundreds of thousands of co-ops uh, that are somewhat unregulated and basically run by farmers themselves. Uh, so you're not gonna find credit cards there. You're gonna find cash economies. Uh, but in Kenya, and so far really only in Kenya, uh, everyone with a mobile phone can send money. Right? So um, M-Pesa is the name of that service. Uh, there are lots and lots of articles describing what it is and how come it succeeded, uh, but really no one knows exactly why it succeeded because no one's been able to replicate it at that scale in any other country. Uh, even when the same company brought the same service to Tanzania, it didn't take off. Uh, and so it's coming. It'll just be a little, it'll be another five or ten years before it's uh, ubiquitous across Africa, and it won't be ubiquitous under one brand. Right? Each, each country will have its own um, own service. All right. In general, what you find is an immature startup ecosystem wherever you go. Right. I I I, I haven't found a single country yet that that has all the pieces that we have here in Seattle or or even have in um, uh, in like Portland, Oregon. Uh, so in terms of finding deals, there are ways to do it, uh, but it's not as straightforward as um, joining an angel group because I haven't found any angel groups. Uh, they may exist out there. I may, it may just be me not finding them. But uh, in Kenya, one of my startups got approached by a group that called themselves a bunch of angels, but they do one investment per year. They don't do the model of having uh, a lunch in every month and, and three or four or five uh, companies pitch them. So I really wouldn't call that an angel group. That's, that sounds like a club. Uh, there are more and more professional capital funds being started up, uh, but it's still sparse. So you'll find um, you know, maybe a dozen of them in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, and you'll find one or two of them in Kampala, Uganda, uh, and you might find one in Rwanda, um, but you're not going to find any in, um, uh, in Zambia right now. Um, and uh, I, heard, I found one in, in Malawi, uh, which is the third poorest country in the, in the world, uh, but they can't find enough deal flow, so they're looking to invest in, in other countries. Um, like most places, uh, banks don't like startups. Uh, unlike the U.S. or Europe, banks don't seem to like companies at all. Ban banks don't seem to like to lend money at all because everybody I talk to complains about the banks. Um, in some countries, the banks charge you money to put to, to deposit money in the bank, which I find uh, a little bit crazy, uh, as well as charging you money to take the, the money out. And the normal interest rates in these countries are on the order of at least 1% per month, so at least 12%, but usually somewhere between 18 and 30%. Um, that would be a normal uh, bank loan if you can get it. And really that's because the default rates are really high because they're highly regulated because they're, um, they don't want to take any risk. Uh, and, and they view startups and um, uh, people targeting the, the lower classes as, as a crazy idea. So really there is no banking that happens in the, in the startup ecosystem. Uh, and then in ter lastly, in terms of talent, um, one thing I left off on the slides is um, uh, half the population on the continent is under the age of 16. Uh, and so there's a lot of kids. Right? So we kind of have to take all the numbers and, and think about them a little differently. So when you say there's 180 people in Nigeria, uh, there are 90 million uh, adults in, a, in Nigeria, near adults in Nigeria. Let's just call it 80 million adults. And a hundred, or in a hundred million uh, kids, right? And so um, that kind of changes the way you look at the size of the market. Uh, but the other way you look at the, the differences is if you're trying to build out a company and you need to hire some management, um, 
uh, that's not as easy to do as it is here. Um, so there are talent, there's talent, they do show up in the main cities. They are uh, huge unemployment rates. Uh, it's at least 25% unemployment is, is the norm in these countries. Um, it's hard to tell exactly what that is because it's hard to break down where the, um, where the kids end and the, and the adults start. Uh, but trying to find someone who's trained to do whatever uh, is, is kind of hard to do. Um, and you find them in the same way you, you, you generally find them here the good way, which is uh, networking. All right, that all said, the opportunities are humongous. So uh, if you're looking to invest in tech, which is kind of a, a common thing for investors to do, uh, there's plenty of tech companies. There's an app for this and an app for that. And, and again, there's uh, a billion people who could use an app that, that help them uh, in life. Um, and again, uh, phone-centric apps, right? So not apps and, and not websites, uh, but something that interacts with people on a phone uh, in a, in a text-oriented manner uh, can take off. Um, that's nice. Personally, uh, I'm no longer a tech investor, um, and so I have a few of those, but mostly I have uh, investments that are uh, what I would call infrastructure, right? And infrastructure includes food. Right. Everybody eats. Uh, the continent does grow enough food to feed everyone on that continent. There's just a lot of losses between uh, growing it and selling it. And so um, they're, they're a net importer of food at the moment, uh, which makes it a huge opportunity to grow food better. Uh, and then in terms of infrastructure, uh, when I use that word, I mean everything. Uh, everything from in better internet access to uh, better uh, logistics, um, shipping, um, uh, information, um, uh, what else have we moved around? Uh, and just moving around um, stuff between retailers and wholesalers is, is a business opportunity. Um, and so uh, keep, keep going on this. Um, there are huge, and when I say huge opportunities, you could probably find 100x opportunities on the continent if you look for them. Um, but don't look for the traditional 10x return the way you're normally uh, have taught to, to do it here in the States or in Europe, right? So I have a whole other, the first, the first of these weekly webinars talks about how to invest without waiting for your exits, because in Africa, there are very few historic exits, right? If you're going to look at a company in any sector uh, and then try and find what other company started in that space and had an acquisition, you're, you're, you're going to be lucky if you find one. Uh, and then on top of that, there are very few natural acquirers. Um, so what I mean by that, if you're not uh, familiar with the term, uh, is if, again, back to tech, if you have a software company here in the States uh, and it takes off and gets out, just go, let's say, 100 million users, um, it doesn't matter if you have any revenues or not. If you grew to 100 million users in two or three years or even one year, you're going to get acquired by Google or Facebook or Microsoft or Apple or someone like that. We've seen that before. It was called Instagram. Uh, uh, same thing just happened with LinkedIn, right? They have about 200 million or 300 million uh, users and Microsoft found value in that and so purchased them, right? That they were already public at that, that stage. Well, in most sectors, in most places in the world, there are not those big public companies that buy success. Uh, and so you, you can't exit that way. You need to do something else. And what you need to do is worry about cash flows instead. So you got a potential for huge profits. How do you share in the profits is, is basically the, the answer there. All right, one big difference I've seen in traveling there. One thing I noticed on the investor circle trip uh, was the difference between expat, expat run companies and native run companies. And I saw this through Fledge as well, and I'll, I'll talk through it as I talk about the companies. Um, and I mean by expats, right, is Americans, Europeans, Canadians that are running companies in Africa. <clears throat> All right, so line by line, I'm going to read this, which, which I generally don't do. All right, so the expats are going to look and talk a lot more like, like you're used to. Right? They're going to talk like you. Uh, they're going to be uh, educated in European and American colleges. Uh, some of the Africans will as well, but nonetheless, um, a lot of the team will come from schools that you've never heard of. Uh, generally, the expats have learned about Africa by either being in the Peace Corps or something equivalent, where they did some uh, service work overseas, fell in love with a certain country or a certain region uh, and, um, and basically the next bullet down. I think they know the market because of that versus the natives who grew up there and truly know the market. Uh, you will find that the expats uh, can and do eventually go home. 
right? That home is not the country they're living in in Africa. That home is still the States or Europe or, or Canada. Uh, when push comes to shove, they're going to wind up uh, running back home. Uh, the natives are already home, which means uh, they really got no place to go and they need to succeed because the cultures in these countries, uh, even the ones that are somewhat entrepreneurial, they don't, look, they don't look upon failure like we look upon failure out in here on the West Coast, right? If you fail, you, you have failed as opposed to have tried. Uh, and so they're going to try a little bit harder. Um, <clears throat> and then the, the uh, punchline here is the last bullet, which is if you're an expat running a co company in Africa, uh, that we've heard of, you're, you've been funded. Uh, and in fact, the funding tends to flow more to the expat c companies than the native companies. Uh, and it does because of the first two lines there, because they look and act like the funders, uh, and the funders are trying to minimize their risks. All right, um, right before I get to the stories, I think there's one, one or two last ones, which is how do you invest? Well, you invest the same way you're used to investing, at least um, that's the way I've been doing it in the uh, former British countries. Uh, so convertible notes, preferred equity. I use revenue-based equity. Um, you can also do loans. Uh, I have organized a few loans uh, into these companies. Uh, and in this case, you can do 10 or 15% interest. And that's uh, considered a reasonable rate of interest to the companies. It's certainly a good, in, a good return on investment if you get it. Um, for the lenders, right? The American and Europeans are not getting 10 or 15% in their home countries right now. And so that's a perfectly good option. Uh, it's a little bit concessionary in terms of the opportunity, but it's a lot simpler to set up and, and, uh, and it's understood on both sides. Uh, and then uh, I have no qualms and have talked to many people who, who agree with me to, direct, to invest in their limited share companies or their limited liability companies, right? So again, common law, um, it usually ends in LTD, not CEO or Inc. Um, and they're just companies, right? You can read their, their articles of incorporation. They look just like the ones here in Washington uh, or Delaware. Um, as, as opposed to um, making them set up an American entity or, a, uh, um, or Seychelles or, uh, or some other offshore haven company and investing in that, right? There's no need to do that. Uh, that actually... Um, in some cases, just adds to your, uh, certainly adds to your cost, adds to your complexity, and, and doesn't increase anything for you. Um, all the investments I've done so far have been in dollars, right? So when we do loans at 10 or 15%, we're loaning them in dollars, which means they're actually going to pay a higher percent of interest because they are taking the, the Forex risk. Uh, all these currencies are, are slowly devaluing against the dollar, just like everything's devalued, uh, going against the dollar right now. Um, but in, in, in addition to that, there is inflation in, these, in most of these countries, and so the, the currencies are dropping due to inflation a bit. Um, and same thing true in my revenue-based structures. We're, we're investing in dollars. They're paying back in dollars, and so um, uh, we're not taking that risk. Um, one thing that's vastly different is that there are uh, um, large amounts of non-dilutive capital. And so in Africa, you'll find grants all over the place. You'll find NGOs all over the place. Uh, it messes up the market here and there. Uh, but the positive is that there's a, a high, high chance that your company could get a grant after you've invested in them, or even they might exist uh, and gotten off the ground because of a grant. Uh, and that's all goodness for an investor because that's non-dilutive capital. Flip side, of course, is that there's, you know, there's just not a lot of structure out there. There's not a lot of investors yet. And so there may not be any follow-on capital after you've invested in the company. So you, you, the kind of companies that I look for, which, again, you'll see in a second, uh, try and use the minimum amount of capital to turn cash flow positive and then turn into cash machines where any follow-on capital would just grow them faster. Right? It's not necessary. It's not, uh, it's not urgent that they get follow-on capital. There's no time frame for it. If it shows up, the company gets bigger, and your um, and you your either your chance of being paid back in your in your loan go up, or if you are an equity investor, then your value goes up. All right, so let's talk about a few of these companies. Uh, one of the poster children in Kenya is Burn Manufacturing. So here's a picture. We can see about two thirds of their factory there on the left. That's Peter Scott, the founder, in the in the foreground. It looks like a pirate. Uh, it's me squinting in the background and, uh, and some investor circle members uh, chatting with him. Uh, this is a very modern factory. It is the most modern factory uh, of its kind in Kenya doing cook stoves. Uh, this is just a tiny little view of, of what's inside. Um, uh, 
uh, large numbers of machines that are stamping out metal or um, or uh, cutting the metal in other ways. Uh, this is the um, the welding section where they're welding the pieces together. Uh, you can see the black um, uh, stoves in the background on the right, uh, and you can see just a piece of the inventory on the left. There's there's like a hundred thousand dollars worth of stoves sitting in this factory on the left. Uh, that's what the stove looks like when I say cook stove. Uh, so the one on the right is the one being sold right now. They've sold 150,000 of those stoves in the past two years, uh, and they sell for about $29 a piece, if I get that right, $39 a piece. Uh, and the stove on the left is about to start production. Uh, those are the hands of Boston Nyer, one of the other co-founders uh, and COO. Uh, this company exists from about eight or $9 million in investment, uh, much of that in the form of loans, uh, about a million dollars in equity and about three million dollars in grants, and clearly it's it's two expats. They're from um, uh, Peter's from uh, just outside Seattle in Bashan Island, uh, Boston. When he was living here, was living in um, in Seattle. Uh, they're now basically all full time in Kenya. Company's doing great, uh, but it took a huge amount of investment. There, there's nothing like this in the cook stove market in terms of uh, scale of investment. Uh, switching tracks very much, uh, other side of town, this is Kibera. This is the largest slum in Africa, one of the oldest slums. I think it's the, the oldest slum in, um, uh, in Kenya. Uh, that is the Ugandan Railroad running right through the middle. It exists because of that railroad, right? The British came in and started building a railroad because they needed to go to Uganda. Uh, and this is where the railroad workers uh, uh, settled because they were um, black and Indian and they weren't allowed to own land in this town. So they just set up a shanty town. Uh, and, uh, and the train was running until last year uh, when there were some protests that pulled up the track. Uh, so this is the nice part of Kibera. Uh, this is uh, more of the inner side. There's like 200,000 people living in this, in this area. There's power, you can see the power lines up there. Uh, there's spigots every once in a while for water, but not every home. Uh, and they're basically the little troughs on the sides for the um, effluent to go. And there's some public toilets. Nonetheless, uh, I can say it was not a very pleasant place to be. Um, we were there to visit this guy. Uh, he's Tom Osborne. He started a company called Green Char. Uh, he's, uh, what, 19 now or 20 now? I think he's 20 now. Um, he started the company in high school. Uh, really got off the ground uh, two years ago when he was 18. Uh, and they sell charcoal that's made out of sugarcane waste, right? So you can see bags of it in the background, Makapoa. Um, and uh, he's actually off to Harvard to get, uh, to further his education. He, he decided not to go off to school right after high school. Instead, he started a company. Uh, and they, he doesn't live in this section of town. Uh, they just do business here. This is where they're selling. They have three kiosks. And that is one of the kiosks. Um, that is one of the nicer ones. Just you can see what it's basically made out of sticks uh, and uh, sheet metal, and someone painted it in the in the branding of the company. All right, the other side of town, uh, same day. I think we we went over to uh, the uh, Mbigasi slum, which is one of the newer slums, uh, and we met. And I can't remember her name. But we met this lady. Uh, she is selling water in that slum, all right, from a company called Jibu. Uh, and Jibu is in, I believe, four countries now, uh, mostly Uganda, uh, Congo, uh, Rwanda. Uh, she's the first franchisee in Kenya. Uh, and they produce water. They basically take tap water provided by the city, but then they bring it into a, um, a production facility that's sitting inside of a shipping container. And so this is a picture inside the shipping container. Uh, the workers are all um, uh, wearing clothing to keep the the uh, you keep their body body hair and whatnot off the off the out of the water. Uh, blurry in the background is the machine that actually does the uh, the water purification. It's uh, you know um, uh, same kind of purification you would find uh, in a um, in any normal modern facility in the U.S. that would be water based. Uh, right, cleaning water or, or making um, soda or whatnot. It's just a lot of filters. Uh, and there's, of course, electricity to, to run all this stuff. Uh, but it's just basically cleaning tap water and then selling it for a profit. Uh, this company was founded by uh, the tall guy there in the middle. Um, 
who's a member of investors, I believe he's a member of investor circle and, uh, and tonic, uh, and his son, uh, and they decided to bring water to places in the world where there wasn't clean water and to do it as a for-profit. Uh, and they're doing quite well. And again, um, uh, they raised about two or three million dollars to get it to the state it is now, and they're, um, they're out raising more money. Uh, I forgot to say, in terms of uh, uh, comparing that, so we, we saw Burn, which raised eight, uh, Jibu, which has raised uh, two or three million. Uh, in between, we, we stopped off at uh, Green Char, uh, run by Tom Osborne, who's Kenyan, right? Grew up in Western Kenya in a, in a fairly poor family. Uh, they have raised a total of about three hundred thousand dollars, where two hundred and fifty thousand of that was grants, um, versus millions of dollars to the expats, um, which you know, again is indicative of what's what's normal out there. Uh, another one we visited on our investor circle trip was Sun Culture. Uh, they sell drip irrigation. So they don't make the drip irrigation. It comes from, uh, I believe it comes from India. But uh, they basically sell rolls of drip irrigation, uh, all the fittings you need to put it into your farm. Uh, it looks like that when it's installed. Uh, there's the founder of uh, Sun Culture. Uh, and so it's all powered by, um, by gravity, basically. You need a tank, uh, and then the water just flows out of the tank and drips through the, through the piping. Uh, the company also sells solar-powered pumps to get the water into the tanks. Uh, and here's a company that had about $600,000 in funding, which is enough to do what they're doing. Um, and uh, their claim to fame is that they can install this on an acre anywhere in Kenya for about $600, which is two or three times less, right? One, like one-third the cost of anyone else in the, in the country. Uh, and uh, one thing we learned on here is, you know, he looks, um, in terms of who is this guy, he looks like an expat. Uh, he's third generation East African. Uh, there was a wave of Indian immigrants into East Africa. And so he is East African, although he was born in, um, uh, in Canada. But his family's from East Africa. He's back to do his business there. Uh, and so uh, here's this, this hybrid of um, uh, native or, or expat, right? So um, born and raised in, in Canada and, and Canadian uh, educated. Uh, and one last one, I think, from this trip we have is Toto Box. Uh, if you're familiar with Finland and how they do baby boxes there, they basically hand a box of stuff to every pregnant woman in Finland that has everything they need. Well, Toto Box sells the same kind of box uh, to NGOs in Kenya to do the same kind of service. Uh, here are the two founders of Toto Box. We were in their office in Nairobi. Uh, they were chatting about how this works. They have a second service uh, that's kind of like baby center. So in the U.S., if you've been pregnant, uh, or your wife has been pregnant, you've probably been to Baby Center. Uh, it gives you weekly updates on what's going on in, uh, for your baby and then has some um, uh, postnatal information about how to take care of your baby. Well, they do the same thing for a fee over text messaging in Kenya. Uh, and basically, again, their customers are usually NGOs that are giving that away or, or some middle-class people who want to pay for it. It's a dollar a year or two dollars a year. Right. Again, if you sell something for a dollar or two, uh, it's easy to sell. Uh, so these guys had some funding uh, and were uh, talking to us because they would like some more funding. So again, the, the natives we found um, were far less funded than the, than the expats. All right, moving on to some uh, fledged companies. Uh, in the foreground there uh, is uh, Ilya Timothea from Tanzania, born and raised in Tanzania. Um, he's in his 20s. Uh, he saw this problem that a uh, half of the fruits and vegetables that are grown in Tanzania never make it to a customer. And so he started aggregating fruits and vegetables from smallholder farmers. That's the term of art. So basically people with an acre or a hectare, which is two acres, uh, started uh, aggregating their produce, started teaching them how to grow better, uh, processing it and selling it into the city. Uh, has increased the, the um, income of about 500 farmers now by almost a factor of four. Uh, and one way to do that is that uh, he added irrigation. There was no irrigation on his farm, just like there's no irrigation on most farms in Tanzania. It's, uh, it's got the climate similar to California, so they could use irrigation. Uh, so uh, we got him a loan, and he used a loan to buy um, a tank and a drill a well and put in some drip irrigation. Uh, he also used some of that money to buy, build some greenhouses because uh, it, it's not that you need the sunshine. It's actually you need the shade and the, and the protection. Uh, he then got a little bit of grant money, which paid for a truck, uh, which is building a, a cold storage facility. 
And so it's under construction now. Uh, and again, in terms of costs, right, you would see something of this scale in the States and you'd think, oh my God, we got to sink in a few million dollars. Uh, his, grant, his whole grant was $400,000 and they've only delivered about 125000 so so far. And so the whole cold for, the whole cold storage facility will be maybe two hundred thousand or three hundred thousand um, built out. Um, uh, he's in a spot in the country that has electricity, which is rare in Tanzania. It's about two percent of the country is covered with electricity, uh, and this is not, I believe, not next to the farm because uh, there's no electricity at the farm. Uh, elsewhere, in a, in a different direction in Tanzania is this guy's name is John Kaira. Uh, he was uh, working for a copper mine in, in neighboring Zambia and decided to move back home to Tanzania uh, and not just grow chickens, uh, but grow chicken farmers. Uh, and so he's got a company called African Chicken. They just were here at Fledge. Um, and, uh, oh, and in terms of money, uh, uh, just go back. To, uh, uh, so East Africa Fruits, which was Ellie's company here, uh, only ever had $65,000 invested in them. Uh, and then they've just gotten a 400, about $400,000 in grants promised but not delivered and a $400,000 loan at a um, uh, way less than 10% interest rate uh, to help pay for this. Uh, and again, most of that's not delivered. It has milestones. Right? That's another, another key lesson is uh, most of these things come with milestones. Uh, so this again, this is John Kyra. He does African chicken. Uh, and what they do is they hand chicks to women farmers let the women grow them. Uh, they hand them the chicks, the feed, the veterinarian services. The women grow the chickens. African chicken then buys them for uh, for a dollar a piece, um, which is profitable to the women because they put no money in, just their labor. Uh, there's about two dollars in profits per chicken. African chicken gets one dollar. The women get a dollar, uh, and uh, it's off and running. It's been going for uh, just under a year. They've done 12,000 chickens so far. There's um, 54 women that are growing chickens right now. And uh, the only money in the company before Fledge was John's. Uh, with Fledge, he's gotten another um, 20,000 from Fledge. And I think uh, we just closed a $20,000 loan from Kiva. And that's it so far. So it's like $100,000 into this company. It's profitable and it could grow to be thousands of women. Uh, one more that just graduated uh, is Jiasi. They're up in Uganda. Uh, this is a picture of a catch of fish now that comes out of Lake Victoria in, uh, in a day's work in Uganda. Basically nothing. Um, the fish are just about gone. Lake Victoria is slightly, it's somewhere in between Lake Michigan and Lake Superior in size. It's huge. Uh, it used to support that whole region in terms of animal protein, uh, but it's been fished out. So what Giasi has invented, um, and I don't know why other people didn't do this before them, but uh, what they've invented is floating cages made out of bamboo, and bamboo is a local product. Um, so you just need nets, which are a local product, floats, which you can find around here because it's a fishing culture. Uh, put them all together, you can get floating nets that you can put in the lake. Uh, and then all you need to make this work out is fish fingerlings, babies, and feed. Uh, and so this company has produced 2 million fingerlings to date. Uh, they have a feed mill and have figured out how to, how to make the feed. Uh, they have the government contract now to supply feed to the fish farmers. Uh, so they are a fish farmer themselves supplying other fish farmers. Uh, so there's the feed mill. A uh, man in the foreground there is Imanu. He's the founder of the company. Uh, and again, the only money in this company before they came to Fledge was his, which wasn't a whole lot. Uh, maybe a few tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, and then he got 20,000 from Fledge. Uh, we gave him a little forward on a loan, um, not quite 20 grand. Uh, and he's talking to a venture capitalist right now to do a few hundred thousand dollar investment. So hopefully that comes through. Company's profitable right now. It, it is of that, um, that style I talked about. It's a profitable company. They uh, produce fish, they sell fish for profit. Uh, the more money they get, the bigger the company will, will get. And they're serving about a tenth of a percent of the market at, the, at this point. Uh, so there's a huge amount of growth opportunity here. Um, and so they're um, supplying fish to um, hundreds of resellers, right? Resellers who basically lost their job in the last 10 years because the fish uh, disappeared. Uh, one more that graduated, uh, this is Joffrey. 
from uh, also from Uganda, uh, a company called Brent Oils. Uh, they are a technology company. They recycle motor oil. Uh, so, you know, these are countries that do have cars and trucks and motorcycles. Uh, they're also, except for Nigeria and, and Angola and a few other um, minor states on the West Coast, there, there's not a whole lot of oil here. The oil is all imported, which means the motor oil is all imported. Uh, but there's no infrastructure for doing anything with the oil when it's done. It's generally dumped or burned. Uh, Brent Oils recycles it and turns it back into motor oil. Only company in East Africa that does that. Uh, only company we could find outside of South Africa or the um, North Africa, which I'm kind of ignoring in this case, right, the North African petro states. Uh, this is basically the, one of the only sub-Saharan uh, companies to recycle motor oil. So humongous opportunity. Only money in this company was out of Joffrey's pocket before Fledge. Fledge has now put in a, a bit of money and um, forwarded some uh, or advanced him some money on, on his Kiva loan before it launches. Uh, and then I believe this is the last one on here. This is a picture of Zueto Enterprise from Malawi. Uh, here's a, an interesting infra infrastructure story. Um, the country of Malawi is basically just farmers, right? So it's like 12 million farmers, third poorest country in the world. So it's mostly subsistence farmers. The only real cash from these farmers comes from their animals. So the, com the country had a, has a ministry of uh, agriculture and, um, uh, and it has more words than that, but what's called, it's called the Ministry of Agriculture, and they used to do all the veterinarian services for the entire country. Uh, and their, uh, most of the budget for the, for the government of this country was, was uh, funded by foreign aid. So they had a bad ruler, the foreign aid pulled out, uh, and basically with it, the veterinarian services disappeared. So now you had poor farmers with animals, and the animals died. Uh, so Zueto, uh, the founder of Zueto, uh, the founders of Zueto, um, worked, used to work for the ministry, got tired of saying no to the farmers and said, well, let's just make it a for-profit. So they have three stores now uh, in three rural areas, right, Karanga uh, and two others, uh, and they are selling veterinarian services and um, vaccines and um, dewormers and other treatments to those farmers in those areas for a profit. Uh, and they did this with a small grant to get going uh, and then $20,000 from Fledge and then hopefully some more money coming in from investors uh, or more grants, right? They need about 50 stores to cover the country. And so they have the first three, uh, for the fourth one's being built out on the Fledge money. Oh, no, sorry. There's one more. We'll finish on a tech note. Uh, this is uh, David Opio from Ensbuco. Uh, as I said, it feels like an hour ago. Uh, most people in the continent don't have a bank account. Most of them use a credit, uh, credit and savings co-op. In Uganda, where David's from, uh, they're called SACOs, saving and credit co-ops. Uh, and nearly all those SACOs uh, do their business on paper. So if you bring some shillings to deposit, bring 100 shillings to deposit, uh, they will take out their yellow pad of paper and write it down, uh, and maybe they'll hand you back a paper receipt that's handwritten. And when you go back next month, if you're lucky, <coughs> excuse me, uh, your 100 shillings will still be on the books. Uh, and I say lucky because there, th we know that money is lost from corruption and just mismanagement from these SACOs. So Enzimbuco is a software, a piece of software in the cloud that puts the management of the SACOs in the cloud. So when you make a deposit, you now get a text message saying 100 shillings was deposited. Here's your, uh, here's your total balance. You can check that balance on your phone at any time, uh, and now you have basically have a, a, a good record so that the, um, the money can't be lost as easily. Well, I keep lying about last ones. All right, Juabar uh, is in uh, Tanzania, uh, founded by a couple of graduates from uh, a school in California. Uh, they recharge cell phones. So this is a country where every adult has a cell phone, but 2% of the population has electricity. So they put these kiosks, those are solar powered kiosks out in rural areas. There's 25 or so rural towns with, with these kiosks. Uh, and they're just uh, cell phone recharging for a fee. So for 20 or 25 cents, you can recharge your cell phone. And these are the kind of phones that last for, for a week, not the, not the phones we're using that last for a day. Uh, and so that's an affordable service. All right, so... Um, 
that's just a small supply. I actually have uh, 16 fledglings out in Africa. Uh, on the trip, we saw about a dozen on the investor circle trip. Uh, so two places I can point you to. You can go to lunarmobiscuit.com slash category slash Africa or just slash blog will take you to the blog and you can click on Africa. Uh, and I blogged about most of the ones we visited. Uh, you can come to fledge.co uh, and come and see all the fledglings. You can click on the top, it says fledglings. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Fledge, it is the Conscious Company Accelerator. We take applications from uh, uh, impactful startups from around the world. We pick seven that we like, the seven best. Uh, we give them each $20,000. Uh, and bring them to Seattle for 10 weeks. The next of these Fledge programs will be in Peru. We're gonna change it up a little bit. It's $10,000 because it costs less to live in Peru. So we're giving seven companies $10,000 a piece, US dollars, inviting them for 10 weeks to Lima, Peru in October through December this year. Uh, again, applicants from all over the world, there'll be a little emphasis on Latin America and Peru this, this uh, coming session because there's a backlog in Peru. Uh, and then next year, we'll do more in Seattle, more in Peru, and we'll be adding more, more cities to the fledge list. Um, and then Aviary is a brand new impact seed fund, uh, global in nature. We'll invest in any impactful company anywhere in the world where the filter is that they have to have graduated from an accelerator program, fledge or another equivalent program. Uh, and we'll be doing uh, normal seed investing, which is you know, fifty to $500,000 investments. Uh, typically revenue-based, but not only revenue-based. Uh, for more details on that, go to aviary.vc. Uh, one more shout out, thank you Investor Circle uh, for uh, having those trips to Nairobi. Uh, that happened to be the first time I've ever been on, on the continent of Africa. Uh, and uh, there's nothing like being there in person. Uh, I highly advise anyone who's thinking of it to get on a plane and go and, and check it out in person and ideally do it with a group that can um, that can uh, connect you to uh, you know, dozens and dozens of people while you're there. All right, uh, before I open it up to questions, uh, next week we're talking about 100% impact investing. Uh, so this is the idea that uh, all your dollars should do impact in the world, not just the ones that you've, uh, not just the small amount you've allocated for early stage impact investing. Uh, and then a week from that, two weeks from today, uh, we'll talk about one of the catch 22s of investing. Uh, which is that you want to invest in interesting, novel, innovative companies, uh, but you want only the ones that are certain to succeed. Um, and so that winds up being a catch-22. So with that, I will uh, turn off the recording. And